just uh, real fast for us as we find our way around. It's good to be together. Um, don't forget that next Sunday, next Sunday, April 7th at 55 plus lunch, um, if you're uh, 55 or have a spouse, um, 55, uh, we don't card you at the door, but 55 plus, if you'd like to be a part of that, just sign up in the foyer. We make sure that we have enough food and everybody chips in, bring something, plus in a $5 chip in for the, the meal there. Please be a part of it. We just, it's a great time um, for fellowship and just uh, spend some time. You're going to probably eat lunch anyway, so we just get to eat it together. So that's after service next week uh, if you're 55 or older. And then next week also, we have the privilege of a guest speaker. We don't have a lot of guest speakers here at Graham View, but um, we try to have people come in that uh, intentionally uh, to be able to share from the depth of their wisdom or the anointing that's on their life. And so have a, someone who's been here with us before and just appreciate him as a friend and also as, a, as a, just a great influencer in um, Foursquare and with the missions work especially. And George Klein will be back with us again. He's been here before, but he'll be here next Sunday morning. So I encourage you to come and just be receptive to um, what the Spirit of the Lord would just encourage and challenge you with next week. And so Sunday morning, um, he'll be here um, next week. So those are two quick announcements. Just want to get to you um, as we get ready to enter back into worship. You know, today as we kind of pause and, of course, this being Resurrection Sunday, and I was so just encouraged by just the, the depth of just the, um, the people that I have the privilege of being a part of here at Grandview that I appreciate someone said, you know, I would... I would wish you a happy Resurrection Sunday, but it's Resurrection Sunday every Sunday. And, and, and so just a reminder that even though that we're kind of pausing today and making great emphasis on this event, it's just a good reminder that every day Jesus is alive in our life. Amen. You know, and, and I know today that there'll be a lot of churches that'll do it different than we do it, and that's okay. We're just um, celebrating the resurrection here at Grandview in the way we do it. I know some places they'll, they'll argue the resurrection um, and, and the, lay out the case. Um, I think that we've experienced, the best argument is every one of your lives that has experienced the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And I know that some places they'll kind of soft talk and, and not make much of the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ or his sacrifice hoping to entice a few of the visitors that will come back next week, or some places it will be filled with individuals that are kind of doing their yearly pilgrimage to kind of fulfill some kind of um, religious kind of action in their life. And I just out of honestly want you to know that, that we're here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm not here to argue. I'm not here to entertain or to, to soft speak um, the, the truth of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you want to celebrate the resurrection, if you want to seek Jesus and get closer to him, um, I think every one of us can do that in our own personal walk with Jesus today. Amen. Uh, so, so I just want to read real quickly Philippians chapter um, 3, verse 10 out of the Amplified Translation because today our desire is to, to seek Jesus even more and to be able to celebrate what he's already done for us. And the Apostle Paul says it this way, and it's again the Amplified Translation. It says, and this so that I may know him experientially, becoming more thoroughly acquainted with him, uh, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person who completely and in that same way experienced the, the power of his resurrection, which overflows in this active in believers and is active in believers and that I may share in the fellowship of his suffering by becoming continually conformed inwardly into his likeness, even to his death, uh, dying as he did. The Apostle Paul, here at one of his later letters that he wrote to the church, he's saying, man, I want to know him even more. Do you want to know Jesus even more? And do you want to know the, the power and that transformational power of the resurrection even more? And as we have that, that hunger and that desire on the inside of us, we will be transformed even more and to be more like him. So let's stand and let's celebrate the resurrection together and experience Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Fighting 
around My delight is found in knowing That you wear the victor's crown You're my help and my defender You're my savior and my friend By your grace I live and breathe to worship you At the mention of your greatness In your name I will bow down
Hallelujah. We are overcomers through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. for my family 
It says, instead he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, darkened and the heavens thundered and for a moment death had thought it conquered but it wasn't over till you said it's over your word is greater still the 
God, I can lift our voices just one more time and just tell him thanks for his resurrection life he's given to us. Amen. Lord, we just give you glory and thank you for your life. Thank you for your love. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Thank you for forgiving us. Hallelujah. Thank you for placing your life, your nature in us. Lord, and thank you for coming again. And we look forward to that day. And so, Lord, help us. Help us in our moment. Help us in this day to live a life that is glorifying to you and all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the first person to preach the gospel was Mary when she was told to go tell the disciples, I'm alive. Turn to someone around you and just preach the gospel. Tell them Jesus is alive and he's coming for you. Jesus is alive and he's coming for you. Amen. He's alive and he's coming for you. That's a good thing, you know. The return of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a living Savior that is returning for us. So again, if you're a guest with us today, we, we welcome you and just welcome you into the presence of the Lord. Uh, we made today a special event in that we could gather together as family and come together and, and uh, bring family, friends, and kids, and, and children, and some of them are already catching up on a good nap this afternoon so they can irritate their parents when they try to take a nap this afternoon. And, but uh, just to come to worship, we do have in the foyer, the speakers are on there, and then we do have a room back there um, also available if you've got children that uh, get a little squirmy or need to go out of the, uh, the, uh, for the, of the service, we've got that prepared for you. But we just wanted to come together and to be able to, to worship the Lord and just experience Him. I encourage you to be here Wednesday night uh, as we can continue to see the uh, ongoing effects of the, re of the resurrection in our lives and how it's impacting us and changing us and just in tremendous things that are going on on Wednesday. Had great service last Wednesday night. Just want to say thank you for those who are able to be here um, and just to intentionally set some time there just to allow um, ourselves to have an intimate moment with the Lord and just um, allow His Spirit to speak to us and for us just to like Jesus, spend some time in the garden and get alone when into the presence of the Lord and allow him to impact us and, and to change our lives on that one-to-one -one basis as we just come to know him in our life. Today's message that I have for you, of course, is based on the resurrection, just as every message really is, because if there is no resurrection, then we of all people are most miserable, the Apostle Paul says. Uh, but there is a resurrection, Amen. And, and it's okay to be excited in church about Jesus, all right? And so if we're even outside of the church, but, but it's great to be able to come together. And we want to just focus on that, just that truth that we have of the resurrection and the simplicity of the gospel that has been given to us. The other day, I was uh, taking Marilyn's dog out for, uh, for a walk, and we're out there for a purpose. We're, uh, we've, got a, we've got a job to get done, you might say, before we get back, and and uh, Marilyn's, uh, it's, how, what's she weigh now? 55. I was thinking we were getting a dog, but we got a hog instead. But anyway, but she's up to, to 55 and just, uh, she's a boxer, so she's just 55 pounds of just muscle and excitement. And so we go out for a, a walk, and while we're out there for um, this walk to get our job done, or our job, her job done, um, all of a sudden she sees a, a rabbit. The rabbits are out now. And that rabbit looked and that rabbit took off in the wrong direction and, and all of a sudden I, my right arm became extremely longer than my left arm because I'm holding on to her. I want you to know that um, lots have been said maybe about your pastor over the, uh, the last several years that we've really made emphasis of this. I'm not here to, I'm not against Easter eggs, I'm not against Easter bunny unless it distracts you from what you're called to do. And if it distracts you and pulls you in a direction that's away from what we're supposed to be all about as the church of the Lord Jesus and the business that we're supposed to be about, then I say we need to get back our focus on what we're doing. And our focus is to preach Jesus. Our focus is to preach the resurrection and the life because that's what transforms lives. Our purpose is to, to uplift him because he is the one that lifted us up out of the grave. And I'm, I'm excited about Jesus and, and, and the simplicity of the gospel in our lives. I understand that as I speak to you today that probably 99.9% .9 of you already thoroughly know the gospel. Maybe there's someone watching online that, that maybe doesn't. 
but I'm sure that majority of us know the, the, the resurrection story. I'm sure that the majority of us have heard it, but I'm sure also that every single one of us can have more of an impact and a transformational power of the resurrection in our daily life as we follow after him. And that's what the purpose of the, the flock, the shepherd, uh, following after Jesus is to be constantly being transformed more and more to be like Jesus and to experience his resurrection power. And so as we come together, I, I just simply have a title for my message today is simply only believe, only believe. That we make sure that in our walk with the Lord, it, it starts with believing in him and his resurrection power in our life. It then continues of a life of believing in his word and the power of his word to transform and to change us, all based on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing that we have the privilege to know Jesus intimately, personally, and it's all because we believe. Turn to your neighbor, just tell him, only believe, only believe, only believe. Turn to your other neighbor on the other side and tell him, only believe. That's, it's based on this, folks. It's not being a part of the right church, the right denomination. It's not uh, fulfilling some rituals. It's about knowing Jesus personally in our life. It's amazing when we stop though and we take a day like today when we look at what Jesus was willing to do so that we could only believe. We reflect back on this last week of, of the, the life of Jesus especially. We reflect back on his suffering and what he was willing to do, all that he was willing to achieve, uh, all that he was willing to prepare for us so that we could just believe. To think of the person of Christ this last week as he prepared his disciples uh, uh, for his death and for the, his resurrection. That he went through the passion, the passion of Christ, that suffering that he went through and the, not just those last hours of the physical pain that he went through with the beating and, and the, the cross that he bore and the, the nails that were put through his hand, but also those, those, those hours, we could say, of the, the righteousness of God who became sin for us and carried our sin, our penalty for every one of us. But oh, thank God for the power of Christ when he was raised from the dead and was raised up victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And he didn't come up alone. The Bible says that we were raised together with him and seated in heavenly places. And all we have to do is believe. All we have to believe. I, I, and sometimes I think it is so incredible of a story. It, it's so amazing the, the extent of the love and the plan of God that it's difficult for us to believe because it's so good and he's made it so simple. But that's because of the good God that we serve, that we follow after. Because he wanted to make it so everyone could experience his saving grace. To understand that the suffering servant became the triumphant king and that we could follow after him and his influence on our daily life. After the resurrection, Jesus desires to step into lives to transform and to change them. Could you pause for just a moment? And again, I'm at this point, I haven't read any scripture, but we'll, we'll get to, the, to that. But, but in the same sense, we've retold the scripture story as we've gone along here. And I pray that it's in, you know, stirred some faith and excitement on the inside of every one of us. But think how Jesus, as he was raised victorious, triumphant as he is, to be able to take the time to pause and to look into the lives of individuals. He stops with Mary in the garden. Gently he speaks to her, words of compassion. He shows up to the 11 disciples and at that particular time because of, of course, especially the assignment and the, the crucial nature upon them of what needed to happen, he, Jesus actually criticizes them for their unbelief. And then there's doubting Thomas where Christ offers the infutable proof of his, of his resurrection by the scars that he still carries, those sacred scars that he still carries on his body. Even years later, we see John, who was exiled to the, on the island, that, that Jesus goes and he represents himself to him and presents himself as, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the, the everlasting one. It seems that Christ knows how to step into every single individual's life and touch them and encourage them and speak to them along their journey 
that he's not just the almighty one that is seated on the throne, but he is the one who wants to speak in every one of our lives and touch us right where we are. Mary's sorrow didn't change the fact that Jesus was actually alive at that very moment. She just didn't know it. But when Jesus came and revealed himself to her, he basically was like, to only believe and go tell the disciples. The disciples that were in fear didn't change the fact of the resurrection, but what Jesus did when he presented himself to them, it, he rebuked that fear, cast it out so that they could go and do what he called them to. And of course, with doubting Thomas, when Jesus says, put your fingers in my hand or in my side, what is he doing there? He is again saying, even though there's the fact of the resurrection, it doesn't change you personally until you believe, until you personally believe. And even John, when he is isolated on the island, Jesus is reminding him, I know exactly where you are, and you got to keep believing. I know that we make you do a lot of talking here at Grandview, but it gives me a chance to take a breath. Turn to your neighbor and say, just keep believing. Keep, keep believing. Keep believing. This amazing Jesus that knows right where everyone is, he knows right where you are in your walk also. He knows exactly where you are if there's either fears or if there's doubts, if you have sense of isolation or confusion, and he's wanting to speak to every single one of us right where we are and to take us to the next level of relationship and transformation with him. And it's always based on you believing. Because you see, the fact of the resurrection had been established. The reality in the kingdom of the spiritual realm, it had been established. Satan has been defeated. Heaven was rejoicing. But until the individual believed personally, it had no effect on their lives. And the more we believe and the more we understand this impact in our lives, the more we are transformed and changed. As we read from Paul's writings, the church in Philippi, that there's a continual transformation that goes on in our lives. This same Jesus wants to touch our lives today continually as we follow after him. Smith Wigglesworth said it this way. He said, God wants us so badly that he has made the condition as simply as he could possibly could only believe. Isn't that incredible? Of all of the the intricate plans that God could have put together so that you and I could experience salvation and an ongoing relationship with God, not just that we know him, but we become like him in this transformational process. Of all the, 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 the complicated plans that even man has put upon it, basically, God says, I want all of you so much that I'm going to do everything that really needs to be done. All you need to do is only believe. Can you, for a moment, start to grasp just how much God loves you? Can you, for a moment, just grasp how much God wants you? And at this moment, you can rebuke all of those thoughts that are coming to your mind right now that saying, God doesn't want someone like you. Or how could God, someone, how could God love someone like me after what I've done? Or even some of us good Christians that we've gone and we've followed Jesus for a while, but then we've messed up, we've failed him. We've, we've fallen back and we wonder, could God ever forgive me of this? And the answer is yes, yes, and yes. He can forgive you, not only can you, he wants to. He only wants you to believe in what he has done for you and receive this incredible, this incredible love. Michelangelo in his famous picture of the hand of God was very... Uh, uh, artistic in his intention of trying to, to really emphasize how much God was willing to reach out towards man. And in particular, he was thinking of Adam, of course, in his fallen state. Adam in, is, is basically in the picture is reclining and sitting back in a sense actually of weakness as he is just barely able to seemingly lift his hand, but the hair of, of what's representing God is being pushed back because there seems to be a momentum where God the Father is reaching out to, to touch his life and to transform his life when Adam could barely lift his hand. I want you to know there's a loving heavenly Father that is rushing towards us with the plan of salvation, the plan of redemption, and the purpose of transforming and changing our lives. And he's willing to do it all if we'll just believe with what we have in our heart. 
He's not asking you to come to church more. He's not asking you to try to be a better Christian. He's not asking you to memorize more scripture. He's asking you to to believe that he loves you so much that he sent his only son to die for you so you could have everlasting life. His nature, his life to come in you so that you could then have a relationship with him and become more and more like Jesus in your life. God knew, God knew that he was gonna have to do it all. God knew he would have to provide the sacrifice. God knew that he would have to go through the suffering. It's interesting as we would flip, if we flip back to the Old Testament, you remember the story where Abraham was taking his only son up to sacrifice and obedience. That, that even though he didn't go through the act right there because God provided a lamb, which is an incredible statement in and of itself, But isn't it interesting that Abraham at that moment had a comprehension of the of the of the of the resurrection because he made the statement that even if 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 he did this, even if he gave of his son in that sacrificial, that God would raise him up again. We know from from Genesis and from from Hebrews and those writings you put them together that Abraham to him to sacrifice his son he was willing to do it because he knew God had said this is the your your promised son and through him your lineage will come and if that was going to happen there was going to have to be a resurrection if Abraham could could believe then folks we ought to be able to believe today and not just comprehend a a philosophy of belief, but a a transformational way of living that Jesus was raised from the dead for me because God promised this life to every single one of us. His intention to reach out into our life to make it available for us. This last week, and I even know someone had mentioned today that they tried watching the Passion movie again um, this last week, and many people, millions have watched the movie and most of us uh, don't understand the language that is being spoken that is there, but there's a, a, a deep connection with what's going on and what we see to a degree there. Many people this week will talk about the Passion Week, and yet most people don't really understand what the word passion means because in our vocabulary, oftentimes we use the word passion more in a romantic sense. You're passionate for this individual. But if you'll pause in just a moment, and I'm, I'm putting this together to understand that all we have to do is only believe, but, but the Father God realized that he was gonna to have to provide a sacrifice that was going to suffer in our place so that we could have everything provided for in the redemptive plan, everything's paid for. All you had to do was believe and receive in your life. The word passion actually is a, comes from a Latin word which means to suffer, to suffer. In simplicity, I guess, with our message today, we would simply say this, the word passion would seem, would be willing, I am willing to suffer for whatever for this. I'm willing to suffer whatever for this. And in in our lives, folks, I just want you to know that that the Father God loves you so much that he said, I'm willing to, to have a, this, this depth of passion. I have this depth of passion for you. I have this depth. It's not a romantic passion. It's, it's not just a, 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 a light desire. I am willing to do whatever it takes so I could offer a relationship with you so that the, the gulf that was once there between God and man could be bridged by the Lord Jesus Christ and we brought back together. He was desiring to do this so that we could only believe. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? How much he loves us. This passion he has for us. Think of John 3, 16, and we oftentimes quote it from the King James, which most of us of my era and, and, uh, and older, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's an incredible statement in and of itself. But listen, if I could, out of the Amplified Translation, with this idea of the passion, uh, the the deep desire that the Father God has for you. Let me pause right here. Maybe some of you are thinking, Pastor, I'm saved. I don't know why you're talking about this. Folks, I'm, I'm thankful that you're saved. My question is, are you living like you're saved? 
Are you living like you have a loving Heavenly Father that was so passionate for a relationship with you that he was willing to sacrifice so deeply that all you had to do, all I had to do was only believe to be able to have this incredible relationship with him. Not just that you get to go to heaven when you die, but right here and right now that we could experience the effects of the resurrection of Jesus in our lives because of what he was. You see, you can't be raised unless, you've been de unless you're dead. And to, to die, he had to, to go through suffering. And I want you to know that there's not enough physical pain that you could throw upon the, 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 the incarnation, uh, the God inside of a flesh body to be able to kill it. Jesus himself said, no one can take my life from me. I have to be willing to lay it down. And when he gave up the ghost and when he said, it is finished, he's basically saying, my, my redemptive uh, work of, of the sacrifice here has been finished as much that needs to be done with the physical body. Uh, I'm going to finish it off now in, in, the, in my becoming sin for you. But when Jesus said it is finished, he wasn't finished. Folks, he just getting started and what he's going to do to transform and to change lives from that moment on. And when Jesus gave up the ghost, when he was willing to die for us, it realizes this great passion that he has for us motivated by a loving heavenly father. John 3, 16, the Amplified, for God so greatly loved and deeply prized the world. Pause for just a moment. This is before the world, before there was one Christian in the world, before there was one church in the world, before there was one, one Catholic or one Protestant in the world, before this, when the world was, was dark and, and and, and, and under the control of, of the God of this world system, Satan, and sin it was having its, its dominion over this world. And God looked at fallen humanity and said, I love them so much. I love them so much. May, if you're a believer here today, may we have the eyes of our Father. May we have the sight of our Lord Jesus Christ that when we look at fallen humanity around us and how they have even perverted days like, like this week and declarations that have been made and things that have been said. When we see the fallen state of humanity around, may we look at them and may the love of the Father so, so move within us, what am I willing to do to reach them, to share the love of God with them, to, dra to grab them out of the, the darkness and pull them into the light of the, of the love of God. For God so greatly loved and, and deeply prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten son, the unique one, the only one, so that whosoever believes and trusts in him as savior shall not perish, but have everlasting, eternal Zoe life come on the inside of them. That verse has been quoted an un, un, innumerable amount of times throughout humanity here as we, we look at this and, and many times in our own life, do you believe it? Have you, have, you, have you changed your heart to accept this incredible love, that to understand that God Almighty greatly prizes you. He deeply loves you. He wants you. And he was willing to go through the passion, the sacrifice, so that we could have fellowship, relationship with him once again. You see, this is so much more than just whether I get to go to heaven when I die. As I get to have God come into my life right here and right now. And then I start to live out of that resurrection. I start to live out of that love. I start to live out of that new experience that I have with him. The apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, verse 22 through 24, the uh, NIV says, this righteousness, remember righteousness means right standing with God. How do you get right standing with God? This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There it is again, folks. How do you get right with God? How do you get right with God? Oftentimes as a pastor, I'll hear people at the, as before, uh, after the death of a family member or a friend, and they'll say, uh, they got right with God before they died. Well, what does that mean? It simply means that, that you've received this gift of righteousness, this this right standing with God is given to us because we, we only believe in what Jesus did for us. Getting right with God is not confessing all of your sins. Getting right with God is not uh, asking people to forgive you. Getting right with God is 
receiving what Jesus has done for you. And his blood wipes, washes away all of our sin. It takes care of it. Now, maybe you want to say you're sorry to people. Maybe you want to ask some folks to forgive you in some areas. But folks, I want you to know getting right with God is receiving what Jesus has done already for you. It's an incredible thing when you stop and think about this amazing love of God. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. For there's no difference between Jew or Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all, and and listen, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemptive redemption that came by Jesus Christ. You see, we read through these verses oftentimes so quickly. Our mind kind of is familiar with the terminology. But are you allowing it to transform and change your life? This fact that we are justified freely. Remember justification, just as if I'd never sinned. For us as humans, that is incomprehensible because we, even though we say we forgive someone, we often keep a little record in the back of our head about it. We may say we've forgiven them, but forgetting that they did it, that's a little bit more difficult along the way. But here, it's just as if I'd never sinned. When we accept this gift of righteousness, what Jesus has done, for when we only receive because we believe in what he's done for us, the Bible says, in God's thought, in God's look at us, it's as if I'd never sinned in my life. Can you imagine how that transforms and changes your relationship? That you're not trying to earn forgiveness from God. You're not trying to stay a safe distance from him, but you're running into the arms of a loving heavenly father who wants to have a deep relationship with you. It's like the prodigal that reveals to us the story of the prodigal who returned, whose father was waiting for his son and embraced him and reestablished his his presence in the family. You have a loving heavenly father who wants to have this relationship with you. I appreciate this last week. I've been kind of watching a few of you and what you put on Facebook there. And thank you for several of you that actually are posting some, some good stuff about Jesus and, and sharing the word with others. Um, Alan Hickman had posted yesterday Romans, five, uh, six, Romans 6, 5. Let's go, okay, if you ain't got nothing else to say, it's good to say the word, amen? And so he had put on Romans 6, 5 yesterday. I'd written it down. And you know, oftentimes I, I carry a, a verse in my, in, my, in, my, uh, in my pocket with me that's the, the song, that, ah, here's my verse, carrying the verse with me, and so I'm just meditating on it, and I was going through things yesterday, carried the verse and just meditating on it, its simplicity, and yet how, how it just, again, it was, it was like, a, like a, a therapeutic work of the Holy Spirit in my heart. Here in Romans 6, 5, it says, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, speaking of Jesus, certainly we, are all, we will also share in the likeness of of his resurrection. I just took that simple verse there and just started meditating. Folks, what a blessing it is to be united together with Christ. Isn't that wonderful that we're not a far distance away? We don't have to wait till we get to heaven to see whether we, have, we get, to go, uh, get to get in or not. We, we don't have to wonder whether God hears our prayers or not. We are united in Christ Jesus. We are united in his death in the sense that he died for us And then he was resurrected, and and he wasn't resurrected alone, but we are raised together with him, the Bible says. We are united or in his likeness, that resurrection life is available for us. That we can know that there is hope after this life, but we can also have the guarantee that because of his resurrection, I can live every day differently because of who he is and what he's done for us. You see, Jesus is not just our ticket out of hell nor is he just our ticket into heaven. He is the resurrection and the life which gives us the ability to have a relationship with him here and now. Let me just take a quick survey, if I could, please. By raising your hand, would you just, would, do you agree that you need Jesus before you get to heaven? Anybody need Jesus in your daily walk? Anybody need Jesus in your home? Anybody need Jesus at your job? Anybody need Jesus in your head? Amen. With some thoughts that you got. I'm so glad we don't have, to, oh, I got hands ripped. I should have, I did an altar call right there. But uh, we all need Jesus in our life. And not just when we get to heaven. We need him right now in our life. 
only believe. Only believe. It's how we experience salvation. That's how we experience the ongoing effect of salvation in our life. Paul said it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. He said, but, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our trespasses. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You see, we look around this room and maybe we count how many people are here. But the reality, folks, is that we are spirit beings. And as far as the Father God is concerned, that we have free access to heaven itself now. That, the, that, that we're not bombarding heaven with our prayers, folks. We get to go right into the very throne room of grace because of, <clears throat> because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ who has made this available for us. And I just want to encourage you today, folks, that at, to not just know Jesus as your Savior when you die, but know him every day of your life. Know that you have free access to the presence of the Almighty God. To understand that we've been raised up and seated in heavenly places, that we are seated with him, that we have a place of position in his presence. Folks, there's a lot of crazy stuff that's going on in this world. It's not going to get better. It's going to get more crazy out there, folks. The, t the Bible says that as we get closer to the end, that they will declare that which is evil good, and they'll call that which is good evil. Everything is going to get turned upside down. And you're gonna, there's going to be a lot of rabbits running out there. And if you're not careful, you're going to start running after them instead of keeping focused on what we're supposed to be doing, the mission that we're called to. Staying focused with your attention on the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father and not on the things of this world that are around us. Keeping our focus on him. One way we could say it this way, folks. As we follow after Jesus, as we know him and accept him, it's like stepping through a door. Many of you today, when you came, you came through the middle doors, and there are automatic doors. As soon as you get close, they just automatically open, and you walk through. No effort whatsoever. Isn't that wonderful? No effort. We try to make it as easy as possible for you to come to church. You don't even have to open a door. It just opens up before you. You know, the loving Heavenly Father made it easy as possible for us to enter into a relationship with him. Jesus is the door, but in a sense, he's kind of the, almost, is the automatic door. As soon as you come up to him and say, I believe he automatically opens up and welcomes us in. And when we step through a door by only believing, it's not because you got the key, it's not because you knocked it hard enough or busted in the, it's not because you were able to slip in one of the other side doors. So you were able to come in because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work for us. But it's interesting to know that in the New Testament, the illustration or the use of a, of a door is used like 39 times, almost 40 times. That understanding where Jesus said, I am the door. Anyone that comes through me, he says, I am the door. A door is, is a passageway. It's a portal. When you stepped from outside, you came through that door inside. The atmosphere changed. Temperature changed. The sounds changed. Everything, it could be raining outside, you step through that door and, and it's dry, hopefully in here. It could be cold outside, you step through that door and it's warm in here. It's a passage, a portal that you go through, and the things change. It, it, it's, it's an environmental change. And I want you to know that when you follow through and you, and you step through Jesus, the door, there's a, there's a spiritual environmental change. You go from darkness into the light. You go from evil into that which is good. You go from being under the control and the influence of Satan and sin into the kingdom of the, of the, of the love of God and, and the authority of Jesus in our lives. There's a, there's a portal that you go through a transformation that changed on the outside you might be the same but folks on the inside there's been a change because you believed because you passed through what Jesus has given us as this opportunity to know him and experience him you see Jesus is like like the bridge that gets us from being lost to knowing Jesus and knowing the father and experiencing the Holy Spirit in our life it's, it's crossing through a, 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 a particular portal or, 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 
or position that you must go. Some, some would say, well, there's many ways to God. Folks, I want you to know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He's not trying to make it difficult for people. He's just making it easy. Folks, when I was in school, I loved multiple choice questions, A, B, or C, because I had at least a chance to get the right answer. There was a chance. If I circled one of them, I, I was going get, to get at least a chance that I would get the right answer. If it was fill in the blank, folks, we were in deep prayer and intercession at that particular moment. But I want you to know that in your life, the Father God didn't give us multiple choice so that we could hopefully know the answer. He gave us one choice so we could be sure of the answer, so that we could be confident of the answer. We could know for sure. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Isn't it interesting that Jesus said that before he was resurrected? Because Jesus is. He just is. He was the resurrection before he was resurrected. And so he could demonstrate that. He could proclaim this. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me. Folks, it's so easy for us as Christians to believe in Jesus for, for years, maybe even decades, that we forget just how much joy this verse should bring into our life. Just how much excitement this verse should ignite on the inside of us. That whosoever believes in him, through him would not die, but should live. Isn't that wonderful? He's not talking about physically living. He's talking about spiritual living, which is so much better because that's for eternity that we're talking about. Knowing the Father, experiencing him. In, John, excuse me, in Romans chapter 6, verse 9, it says, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. And if death doesn't have dominion over Jesus, and if we are united with Jesus, then death no longer has dominion over us either. Pastor, does that mean that I'm never going to die? Physically, you're going to die. Physically, you're going to... I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to the day that I can check this body in and be able to experience the life that Jesus has for us. But what he's speaking here is, that we're not gonna know that eternal separation from the Father God because we've experienced this incredible bridge that we know that we can pass through by only believing in what Jesus has done for us. Let me read a verse that oftentimes is read at funerals, but I think it's good for us to read every day in our life. If I could, in, in John chapter 14, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Again, he's saying only believe, only believe. The emphasis is on your believing. The emphasis is on you having that faith on the inside. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to repair a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And that's when Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. I'm the bridge. What an incredible truth that's been given to us through the resurrection. The truth that how much the Father God loves you. Extremely how he was, with great extent of love, was willing to reach out to us. The resurrection reminds us also of what the penalty of our sin is. What the Father God had to do through the substitutionary work of Jesus. The sacrifice that Jesus had to go through for us. For us so that we could only believe. To stop and to remind ourselves that if God loves us so much... If Jesus was willing to do so much for us, for us living for him is really such a small thing. To just simply follow him, pass through the door, stay on the bridge, keep believing as we follow after him to experience this incredible relationship that we have. You see, church, it's not about being a member of a church. 
It's about being a member of a family. The Father's family. It's about being adopted into his family. And the only way that happens is because he says, I love you so much. I've made the way. Will you believe and accept and receive the simple gift of salvation that transforms you from one place to the other as you pass through the portal, as you pass through the the work of our Lord Jesus Christ? Years ago, there was a missionary from Great Britain. Eric uh, Barker was his name. He was in Portugal uh, right before the, uh, the World War II. And during that time, things, the conditions that were getting uh, rather dangerous. He was undergoing quite a bit of uh, adversity. And so he was advised by people that he should send his wife and eight children. Can I hear an oh me from anybody in the room here today? But was advised to send his wife and eight children um, to go back to Great Britain for safety. And so they arranged to be uh, sent on a a steamer. The wife, the eight children, um, also his sister and three children um, were also evacuated at that time. Uh, Baker, he remained behind to uh, continue finishing up some uh, mission matters there before he was uh, going to leave. Then one Sunday after the Baker's family um, had left, he stood before the congregation and he said, I've just received word that all my family have arrived safely home. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm sure at that time that that was quite a concern. I'm, I'm, I've just received word that all my family has arrived safely home. He then proceeded on with the service as usual. It wasn't until later that people full, had a fuller understanding of what those words meant. A submarine had torpedoed the ship that his family was on, and all of his family was lost that day but he knew they had arrived safely home. His concept of eternity, his assurity of their salvation, overrode the grief that he experienced just moments before he had to step behind the pulpit. Folks, I'm sure that he grieved greatly because of the loss of his family, but he had a great joy on the inside of him of knowing they had passed through the door that they had only believed, that they had stayed on the bridge and made it to the other side. And today, folks, as we just wrap up our, our time of reflection on the resurrection, as I said, I'm not here to lay out an argument of the resurrection. I'm not here to make this just a nice service that maybe you'll want to come back next week. I'm not here just to check the box so that you, you said you made it to church on Easter. I'm here to remind you that there is a Father God that loves you extravagantly, that he desires deeply and with his passion for you was willing to sacrifice his one and only son greatly for you so that you and I could only believe and experience this amazing, amazing gift of salvation. Our sins are washed away as if they had never been committed. We are immediately put in right standing with the Father God. And his presence in our life is there every day. And we can know him. And we can be transformed to be more like him. As the ushers are coming and we're preparing to receive communion. I want you just to pause for just a moment and just think about this holy invitation that has been given to us. This invitation to be a part of a family. I don't want anyone just standing at the door. I want to make sure every one of us, and whether it's someone in this room or someone watching online, that they're very clear and understand. To step through the door, to step through the portal, to have the the transformation in our life. It's only by believing in what Jesus has achieved for every single one of us. So my first question, before we receive communion, do you believe? Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? Have you make that simple step of going through the doorway and experiencing that spiritual transformation in your life? Pastor, I don't know if I have or not. The Bible says all we have to do is call on the name of the, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's just simply saying, Jesus, I need you. I need your forgiving work in my life. I need a relationship with a loving heavenly father and I thank you for providing it for me. 
I believe and I receive. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, Pastor, I, I've done that. But I, I, I'm going to ask you again, do you believe in the way that you're living your life? Are there some thoughts, some things that need to change? Some rituals that need to change? Some good works of righteousness that need to change? Do you believe? Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And remember as Stephen plays this song and ministers to us, I like the title of it, He Paid It All. And that's just a good reminder for us today. He did it all for us. believe this is made possible because because of Jesus and only because of Jesus his life his love his completion in the work of redemption if you would like to and we have open communion and all those that maybe today is the first day that you really knew Jesus in your life and believe we welcome you to the Lord's table if you will just remove the bread from the cup Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. It speaks of the passion. 
his determination to come to be here with us, to transform and to change our lives, to be here as a man, full of God at the same time, but also now for God to come and fill every single one of us, to be transformed and changed in our lives. Father, we thank you for your love, and thank you for the bread of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. We receive this bread. We ask in Jesus' name that sickness, disease will be taken away from the midst of us as you bless our bread, the bread of life that gives us strength in Jesus' name. Amen. The cup, which represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for us. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But we're thankful that the sinless blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, was shed upon, upon that cross and was put on the altar of heaven itself. And so, Father, we thank you for forgiveness. Thank you that we receive forgiveness and may we be people that are quick to forgive. We do this in remembrance of Jesus. And if he could forgive us, we receive it and we'll be quick to forgive others because of your incredible love that's in us. We choose to live different in this environment now that we've stepped through the portal of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gave us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can go rejoicing, know that we have victory in our life through our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you, and go have an, another amazing Resurrection Sunday as we do every day for his glory. God bless you, and we love you.